so namaste everyone once again uh, so this is technically our uh, you know uh, seminar number 8 so here we have you know a renowned you know mathematician and scientist uh, from nepal patraman pradhar sir and so this is uh, eighth uh, you know seminar as i am today so we'll be discussing on uh, so the gallery you know calculus gallery which is one of my you know favorite areas of mathematics so without further delay so i will, i would like to request patraman sir to start the session patraman sir over to you thank you everybody uh, so uh, my seminar on mathematics three of ages this is seminar 7 on mathematics yes you know was mathematics my life just one motivation talk so real uh, seminar is actually seven <laughs> so today my title will be the calculus gallery yeah. possible i should start with you do because if we if we know what is calculus and we have been using calculus for so many years so i don't have to talk too much about the calculus math as mathematics so i'll give the prelude because i have to talk about the history of mathematics and how calculus came into existence and then what calculus is doing and all these uh, things which we know prelude we we'll start from we should start from galileo born uh, in 1954 which was in italy and died in italy in 1542 so this is a quote from Galileo, he said that all truths are easy to understand once they are discovered. But the problem is, the point is how to discover them. Once you discover, it's okay. So Galileo is considered to be the father of modern science, not only mathematics. Galileo invented and Im improved telescope that led him also and described the moons of Jupiter, the rings of Saturn, the phases of Venus, sun spots, and rock lunar surface. That is rock. Galileo's advocacy of a heliocentric universe, that is, the sun is in the middle, brought him before religious authorities. When he was forced to recant and place under house arrest for the rest of his life, like, actually he struggled. So when we are studying history, in the first uh, S1, I have told that history we should learn not only the people and his dig these are our discoveries, but you should know the struggle behind. Uh, all these discoveries in 1632 galileo published his dialogue concerning the two chief world systems which supposedly contained arguments for both sides of the helios concerning heliocentric debate galileo was summoned before a roman inquisition in 1633 at first he denied that he had advocated heliocentrism but later he said he had only done so unintentionally this is the title page of dialogue concerning the Two chief world system. I tell you, I tell you. I will talk about this uh, paper a bit later on also. And <clears throat> this, uh, this is inside. That was the cover page. It was like cover page, and the cover page and inside it looks like this one. So this dialogue concerning the two chief uh, world system. The dialogue concerning the two chief world world system was Galileo's comparison of the Copernicus system. In which Earth and other planets orbit the Sun, while the traditional Ptolemaic system, in which everything in the universe circles around the Sun, Earth. The book was published in Florence, in Italy, 1632, under a formal license from the Inquisition. We got a permission from the Inquisition to publish the book. In 1633, Galileo was convicted of grave suspicion of heresy based on this book, which was then placed on the index of forbidden books. From which it was not removed until 1832, but it was almost 200 years. It was the forbidden book. The book is presented in a series of discussions over a span of four days among two philosophers and a uh, layman. So Salvinati argues for the Copernican positions and presents some of Galileo's views directly. He is named after Galileo's friend Filippo Salvinati. This uh, Argus near Salviti was a perfect explanation uh, in that dialogue. And Sagredo is an intelligent layman who is initially neutral. He is named after Galileo's friend Giovanni Francesco. So 
he used the friend of the name of the friend to put it in dialogue. And there was a third person called Simplicio, he is a dedicated follower of Elomi and Aristotle, who presents the traditional view and arguments against the Copernican positions. So, with these three characters, uh, there is a dialogue between these three characters. So, this uh, three people uh, make, uh, gives a dialogue over the so, same set character. Seems that the application for simplicity says that how do you deduce that it is not all but the son which is the central of a revolution of Paris and this Salvenio gives all this uh, definition. So, uh, I am not going to read about this, I am just trying to show you that this dialogue goes on nearly 70 at the time of his trial when Galileo was already 70. Galileo lived in his last nine years under comfortable house arrest. Writing a summary of the early uh, motion experiments, Galileo's laws of motion get from his measurement that all bodies accelerate at the same rate regardless of their mass or size. This paved the way for the codification of classical mechanics by Isaac Newton. So, actually, Galileo was the backbone for the, the classical me mechanics developed by Newton. We'll talk about Newton later. So, he was in Pisa. This is the photo of Pisa, which I have taken not long back, on July 11, 2019. So I, we happen to be there. You can see it is leaning tower of Pisa is so nice. And we are there, on that day, very nice sunny day, and people put this hand there, and then say that, oh, they put perpendicularly, and they put perpendicularly, and they try to compare uh, the inclination of this uh, leaning tower of Pisa. Now, Galileo's experiment of law of motion is like this. So once he went up here in the top and threw the ball. So once you throw the ball, once you threw the ball, big can box small ball, they come down at the same time. Same acceleration. With the same acceleration, they come down and this is the bottom uh, like this. This is the real uh, animation of the real experiment performed by Galileo in the leaning tower of research. This leaning of tower Pisa gave him this opportunity to make such an experiment. Okay. So I have this uh, the dialogue on mathematics written in English version is by Alfred uh, Daney. It was published in Budapest in 1965. So small piece from here. The first dialogue was published in Hungary by Mathematics Mathematical Institute of Academia of Science in 1962. A French translation appeared in 1963. English version of this first chapter, so that this dialogue of matters was published in Canadian Medical Bulletin in 1964, July 1964. English version of the first chapter, uh, this Socratic dialogue of matters was published in Physics Today on, in December uh, 1964. So the book was has no preference. This book has no preference. The most of the book has problems. It has no problems, but it has a postscript, the last at the bottom, at the uh, end. The book is written in a dialogue style, which was used by Socrates and later by Galileo. It has three dialogues the Socratic dialogue on mathematics, the dialogue on application of mathematics, the dialogue on the nature of language of the nature of book of nature. The book was translated in Russian, the translated in Russian in 1969. So, not going all the dialogues, so you can read uh, this dialogue on your own. You can find it in the data of so, so, from the postscript, uh, paragraph from the postscript, since in the first dialogue I have discussed the relation of mathematics, reality, only in general philosophical sense, in the second I wanted to make central a more detailed discussion on application of mathematics. It was logical to choose. Archimedes as the first character, chief character of such a dialogue in his name, even in ancient time, was inseparably connected with his with such application. His historical frame of the second dialogue, however, did not allow me to say all that I wanted to about this controversial topic. This is from the first people of that book. So I will not read this long one. So it has no, uh, this preface, it has a small uh, paragraph. Uh, I I read a small paragraph of this dialogue. All right, then tell me, do you know what mathematics is? So this 
paragraph is interesting for us. So Socrates asked, do you know what the mathematics is? I suppose you can define it since you want to study it. So Hippocrates wanted to study mathematics with Socrates and he asked the question. Then Hippocrates gives the answer, I think every child could do that or define what is mathematics. Mathematics is one of the sciences and one of the finest sciences. Science. And Socrates said, I did not ask you to praise mathematics, but to describe its nature. For instance, if I ask you about the art of physicians, a physicist, doctor, you would answer that his art deals with health and illness and has aim of healing the sick and preventing death. Am I right? Certainly. So, dialogue goes in such a nice format. Then Socrates said, now tell me, my young friend, what is the object of mathematics? He first asked about definition. What things story a mathematics study? In the book press, I have heard, I have, I have asked Jetiatus on her mathematics, his friend, the same question. He answered that a mathematician studies numbers and geometrical forms. Partially correct. And Socrates said, Well, the answer is right, but would you say that these things exist? Do numbers exist? Do geometrical forms exist? Of course. How can we speak of them if they do not exist? Then Socrates said, Then tell me, if this if there were no mathematics, would there be prime numbers? And if so, where should they be? So the question goes very nicely like this. I'm not going to read all the dialogues. You can read it. Uh, since I have the book uh, with me, I could guest here. Hot paste. So I'm not going to read it. Uh, I also have a mathematics uh, Russian version of this dialogue. On mathematics, the title of the edition of Dialogue on Mathematics by Alfred Rainey, published in 1969. I purchased this book on 3 12 69. So I purchased it on 3rd of uh, December 69 in Moscow. So the book is very clear. So there are nice uh, discussion about the Hippocratic City. As a matter of fact, so that's mathematics, just the topic I want to talk to you about. So, Kratis, then says, Hippocrates, you certainly know that I am not a mathematician. Why do you take your question to the celebrated Theodorus, who was really a mathematician at the time? Hippocrates said, You are amazing, Socrates. You answer my questions even before I tell you what they are. So, the question goes like this. Very nice the question. So, I am not going to read all of you. You can read it. Uh, okay. You have to understand that such dialogues was very interesting to read and it sort of gave you a philosophical aspect of uh, mathematics and the mathematics formula here. If mathematics, mathematicians think about prime numbers, then they exist in their consciousness. But if there are no mathematicians, the prime number would not be anywhere. So, very interesting. So, and I'm not going to read all these things, but just to show that these are very interesting uh, dialogues. Now, after Galileo, I go to Jeffrey Brahe from Denmark, 1646. Brahe invented uh, many instruments such as the Tychonet quadrant to measure the uh, stars, which were widely copied and later invented of improved observational equipment. In 1600, Tycho Brahe had Jonas Kepler, another important person, as his assistant, made some of the most accurate observations of century poisons which could eventually prove useful to his predecessors. But at that time when they run they run telescope, very simple telescope. But even at that time this type of guy made such a accurate uh, measurements of the poison of the stars, which is very amazing. So he has to spend a lot of nights gazing at the star. I gave uh, Jonas Kepler a job as his assistant. Together they began working on a new star catalog. So they made a catalog of the stars. The catalog was eventually published by Kepler in 1627 as the Rudolfi type tables. It's called uh, Rudolfi tables. These were by far the most accurate astronomical data tables ever published with planetary data and 1006 star positions. You can see what a tremendous walk and this work they must have done. So there is a page from this uh, fine table. It's a voluminous book, but I am showing one page from that book. 
So in Jack O'Brien's divine godness gave us the most careful, careful observer, stabbing an idol of eight arc minutes in the Ptolemyum calculation. These eight arc minutes could not be ignored. They formed a great part of the work which gave great total the formation of astronomy done by John Kepler who talked this this table. So now coming back to the coming to Johannes Kepler, he was a German, 1571, Kepler's three law of planetary motions can be distributed as follows, which we know. But all friends move about the sun in elliptical orbits, about the sun having the sun as on the first seat in the center, because elliptical has two focus. It is after lining any planet to the sun shifts about equal area, equal length of time, equal area in equal length of time, and the third uh, is uh, law is the square of the serial period or revolution of planets are directly proportional to the cubes of their mean distance from the sun. So we also made this uh, picture. Sun he put in the focus to one of the center of this ellipse and so all planets move around the sun in elliptical orbits having the sun as one of the focus. This from the laws you see this these two areas are equal. These two areas are equal. A one is area A one is equal to get that is thought law. And Kepler gave all this data measuring all this motion of this planet Mercury, Venus, or Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. So, Pluto was still not invented or discovered at the time. So, he made all this discovery. So, the Thomas Kepler says that where there is matter, there is geometry. That because if you see the picture is geometry, the motion is pictorially given in it. Now, that was Pluto. Now, today's talk is uh, I have talked, given title as the Calculus Gallery. So, I have this. Uh, book, the Calculus Gallery, Master's Frame, uh, Master Pieces from Newton to Jewish, written by William Durhan. So I have this book with me. So I am using this book for today's presentation. Okay. The Calculus Gallery, in most, from, I, have, I have quoted from this book, The Calculus Gallery, in most disciplines there is a tradition of studying the major works of illustrious procedures. So I am talking about as by Newton. I am a talk talk of Newton. I come down right now. I start with Kepler and Galileo, the so-called masters of the field. Students of literature read Shakespeare. Students of music listen to Bach. So uh, for us, before we start what is calculus, we have to look at that prelude which I have shown. In manifest, such a tradition is, if not entirely absent, at most fairly uncommon. This book addresses that situation, although it is not intended as a history of the calculus, I have come to regard it as a gallery of the calculus. So it's not a uh, historical, uh, chronical way, even even in a, a bit different way, where this uh, big masters of that field is mentioned here. In the end, I have assembled a number of masterpieces, although these are not the paintings of Rembrandt or Van Gogh, but theorems of Euler or Raymond. Such a gallery may be a bit unusual, but its objective is that of all worthy museums we serve as a repository of excellence. Like in a gallery, this one has gaps in its collection. Like in a gallery, there is not space enough to display all that one might wish. The calculus, so this, the quotation is from John Van Newman, 1903, 1910. The calculus was the first achievement of modern mathematics. And it is difficult to overestimate this important. It is a bridge that carries strength from the basic of elementary mathematics to the challenges of higher mathematics. And as such, transition from the infinite to infinite, from the discrete to continuous, from the superficial to the profound. The calculus was a rich history and a rich prehistory also. Archimedes of Syracuse, who never existed before. Right. CA means approximately. When you see this word CA, which is like approximately, that net yet are not known. So somewhere between 227 and 212 before Christ, found certain areas, so the Archimedes found some formula for certain areas, volumes, surface with a technique 
we now recognize as proto integration. So not a direct integration we use it as this, but it was something later like an integration we call it proto integration. Much later, period if you're mad, 1665, determined slopes of the Andes and areas under cost need to be markedly more than fashion. Now, we mentioned the name Archimedes this silence. We'll just read the name. Archimedes, or simply Archimedes, the greatest mathematician of antiquity, made his greatest contribution in geometry. Among Archimedes' most famous work is measurement of the circle, in which he determined the exact value of pi to be between the values 3 times 10 to the power 10 upon 71, 9 being by life being 3 to 1 by 7. So this 3 1 by 7 is 22 by 7, which we use very frequently as the value of 5 in our school time. So, infinitesimal in the ancient group period where the equivalent of modern lake calculus, modern lake calculus. Infinitesimal therefore means an extremely or infinitely small quantity. As similar can be used, can be said we have introduced calculus to infinitesimals long before Newton and Leibniz gave us the roots of the calculus. Then came the failure of the calculus. Denmark, in the 1665, the French effectively invented modern number theory, for which we have not so much last time ago. It's the same as virtually single handed. He discovered several new patterns in numbers, which were which has defeated mathematics for centuries. That means we all yet we were not able to solve some most of this problem. He is also given credit for all the developments that led to a modern calculus. So that must identify a subset of numbers known as Feynman's numbers, which are the form of one less than two to the power of a uh, of a power of two or written manually into power twice in plus one. He discovered that every single prime that is divided by four and leaves a remainder of one can be expressed as a sum of two squares numbers. It is known as two square theorem. So five we can write as one square plus two square. Thirteen can be written as two square plus thirteen. Forty-one is you can see this is uh, two square theorem. Forty-one you can write forty-two square. That means every single prime number that is divisible by four and leaves a remainder of one can be expressed as sum of two squares. And we know about this last last, last year, the FLT, which we have discussed that from there was started looking at at work done by Greek mathematician right on this type of this equation, often known as the father of algebra, he is best known for his automatic hypocrite automatic the work on the solution of algebra equation and alternative numbers. Automatic is a collection of 130 problems giving solutions to determine equations and indeterminate equations. So this is the uh, cover case of the reference. This automatic some pages from there. In the margin of this copy of Diamantis, this copy of Diamantis, or uh, out in the, this automatic problem number 18, where man wrote, to divide a cube into two other cubes, a fourth power or in general any power, whatever into two powers of the same type denomination above the second is impossible. And I have assured, assuredly formed an admiral proof of this, but the margin is too narrow to contain it. It's not written in a margin. So the theorem was really described here. It's a stable note in the margin of this copy of the contest automatic that states that a to power n plus beta power n equal to c only for the interest value of n greater than 2. It can't satisfy this ABC, it can't satisfy this equation. This seemingly simple conjecture has proved to be one of the world's hardest matter problems to prove, for which we have talked earlier. And in addition to his work in number theory, the clear we are not interested in number theory, we are interested in calculus. When man's effort and his development of calculus to some extent, his work in this field was invaluable later for Newton and Leibniz while investigating a technique for finding the center of gravity of various planes and solid figures he developed a method for determining maxima, minima, tangents to various costs as essentially equivalent to differences. Now, the most uh, hero of today's topic is of course Newton. We have heard about this Newton's 
that one. So, you can see Newton was sitting there thinking the apple fell on his head and then this equation was forces g into m1 m2 by r square. See, of Newton, apple smashing on his head gave rise to this formula. Almost. So, Isaac Newton, British mathematician, Newton was born on Christmas day of 1642 by a lucky person, a dangerously premature infant, very small, frail and tiny enough, okay, enough to put into a wet or small pot, according to his his friends, his father had died in early October, so Newton's mother was left alone to care for this dedicated to However, the way they were from all these initial dangers and the harsh in cold days and winter, that is, you uh, okay. And in the end, Isaac Newton would live to the impressive age of 84. So he was tried at the time of what, what he could he would live up to the age of 84. We go today, he was Cambridge as one of a handful of truly great centers of drawing, may find hard to believe the state to which conditions have decade in the 1660s. Also were appointed for political or ecclesiastical reasons for, and for many scholarships were simply irrelevant. There are records of faculty members who op occupied this position for half a century without having a single student or writing a single book or giving a, a single lecture. But that was a, in 1660 it was a, such a uh, time when Newton was there. Uh, this is a picture uh, known as the Newton Bridge in Cambridge. I have taken this photo on I'd like to find five. This bridge is totally made of wood and without no nails. There are no nails. Later on, this million uh, people in Cambridge, they wanted to find how this bridge was constructed. So this, they dismantled the bridge, but they couldn't reassemble it. They have to use nail and brasses to put this bridge uh, in shape again. That is what the people told there when we were there in uh, Cambridge in 2005. So, Newton was an English physicist and mathematician who had a culminating figure of science in the revolution of the 17th century. In optics, he discovered of the composition of white light, spectrum, in mechanics, Three laws of motion, which we know. In mathematics, it was the word discovery of infinite calculus. The Newton's philosophy and natural principle of mathematics, that is, mathematical principle of natural philosophy, published in 1687, was one of the most important single work in the history of science. Until recently, uh, until nearly the end, Newton presided at the Royal Society okay, and supervised the meet. Meet with where the money is being meet made. This is a natural phase of philosophy, natural principle, mathematics. Yeah. Uh, we know about the laws of motion, so, have, so we know all these things. Motion, so I'm just showing it. You can read it at home. We can, we know all this. But I'm getting this well, most important formula uh, he got uh, from the apple falling on his head. <laughs> we have seen that. And then another uh, economist uh, in Cambridge, John Main and Dennis Rice about this Newton, his peculiar gift was the power of holding continuously in his mind a purely mental problem until he has seen straight through it. So this is what Newton to you go here. Uh, there's praise of Newton in other forms. So the world was abandoned in his praise of his of his mind, or his Alexander Pope. The great man, British poet, was moved to write, Nature and nature's law lay hid in night. God said, Yet Newton be, and all was white. <laughs> Until Newton came, it was night, no night, dark. Now, in this gallery, gallery, gallery we enter the Newton's room now, as written by William Gallon. Newton's discovery began in the mid 1960s. While he was a student at Trinity College, Cambridge, 
His first attempt to put his thoughts on paper is upset in the October 1960 track, which he subsequently re re uh, refined and explained, expanded as a the analysis of 1669 and further forced into matter Foxionius at Serenium in Planetum of 1699. Although you know, more articles were written in Latin language. His writing treated maximum and minima in fan series, tangents, and it is still the basic topic of elementary calculus, which we read these days. It is reasonable to presume that Newton's trumps swept in the world in 1669. Of course, it did not happen that way, it didn't happen that way. In spite of their mathematical presence, his results remain unpublished for decades. For reasons as much psychological as scientific, Newton chose not to share these discoveries in point, and so the glory of first publication would fall to another person. He later described his days of fruitful discovery as those when he was in the prime of age for invention and uh, minded mathematics and philosophy more than at any more at any time since. For that period of invention, mathematics would be forever grateful to Newton. It was not Newton who taught the whole calculus. The distinction, the distinction belongs to a celebrated contemporary Leibniz. Uh, okay, Fred William Leibniz, 1646-1760. The much talented Leibniz has this added good with only modest mathematical training. So Leibniz, we know his very, very well, but he had a only Modest mathematician. Newton's paper on calculus in 1669, he wrote a paper on calculus, but was published only in 1711. In 1671, he wrote another paper on calculus and was published only in 1736, nine years after he was dead. In, 19, in 1676, he wrote another paper on calculus and was published only in 1704. So none of his work on calculus was published until the 18th century. Now we enter the other room, the Leibniz room. The situation he recalled his words. The situation is recalled in his words. When I arrived in Paris in the year 1672, I was self-taught as a as regards geometry and indeed had little knowledge of the subject, for which I have not the patience to read throughout the long series of books. With guidance from Christian Huygens, 1695, Leibniz sought to remedy of, of this defect, Leibniz moved from novice to masters in short order. Within a few years, he has created the calculus. So, this is a picture of how he created the calculus. <coughs> Diagram Leibniz used in the argument from this. Like Although his purpose may be far from evident, it yet behind one to Leibniz create all this discovery. Um, his Tangle of lines, he deduces that 1 minus 1 minus 3 plus 1 plus the alternating odd series will give the storm 5A4. This is not the so called Leibniz series. We won't have a place of honor in our museum of Leibniz room. The left side of the equation displays a trivial pattern, the right side half of half of pi. Okay, that is 1 fourth. Anything but work is. So it was believed that here for the first time the area of the circle was exactly equal to the series of rational entities. So if you want to measure the area of uh, circle, you have to have the pi value of pi. We might take issue with this issue, use of exactly, but it's hard not to go to the reaction of Huygens who said praise the group very highly. And where he returned to discussion said in the letter letter that I complete uh, with this note that it would be a discovery always to be remembered among mathematicians. There will be no artifact in the calculus gallery which is more generated this than the document shown in figure. Next slide. Okay, this is his slide. So Leibniz's first paper of differential calculus section 24. This was the first phase of the first publication on calculus. So, so historical base. I have to go away. So, continuing with the Leibniz room, in October of 1684, issue of the Acta Erudium. Acta Erudium was a prominent mathematical uh, 
thermal at a time. Leibniz presented a new method for finding maxima, minima, and then, and in the last line of the title, promised a remarkable type of calculus. In 1684, the calculus has been twice discovered. Newton also has discovered. So, discovered and had been described on the journal. The next step was a textbook, a way of organizing and clarifying Leibniz's dense ideas. The first text appeared in 1696 under the title LHSD, Infinite Batches Post Batches, and it's of infinitely small for understanding of our lives. Its author was Marcus Dion. The other stuff, 1671, 1704, we have a for finding that. Continue with the Leibniz Zoom, not a mathematician of the highest rank. Hospitals acquired much of his material through a financial management with Joan, Joan Bernoulli, with about two we have talked earlier also, in which the letter that is owned by OAP provided him with lectures that were to become his book. So actually, it was just a uh, fee paying lecture. It is important to note that the hospitals was candid about the source of his work, referring to Leibniz and Bernoulli, he wrote, had, had made fee free use of their discovery, so that I frankly return to them whatever they please to claim as their own. It began with some definition, chief among which that was that of the differential equivalent of the hospital, the infinitely small part of which a variable quantity is continually increase or decrease is called differential, differential or differential of that quantity. Now coming to Leibniz, very important or mathematician of the time in Germany. 1946, 1760. Leibniz was a child prodigy and a contributor in the many different fields of the world. This child prodigy, uh, very brilliant from very childhood. In the next uh, seminar, we'll talk about two mathematics of child prodigy. Okay. So, between his work on philosophy and logic and his day job as politician and living in the outer wild house of Hanover. Leibniz still found time to work on matters. He was perhaps the most uh, first so explicitly implied, implied a mathematical notion as a function to denote geometrical concept uh, derived from the common. So, about this Leibniz, Leibniz developed a system of infinitesimal calculus independently of his contemporary Sir Isaac Newton. He also received the ancient methods of solving equations using matrices, invented a practical calculating machine and pioneered the use of the binary system. During the 1670s, slightly later than Newton's early work, Leibniz developed a very similar theory of calculus, independently from Newton. Leibniz developed the basic features of this person of calculus while living in Paris. During the, he is a German, but he lived and worked in Paris during the 1670s. In 1676, Leibniz had a foundation of both integral and calculus. So in 1684, he published Nova Method Pro Maxima Minus, that new method for greatest and the least, which was an exposition of the dimensional calculus. On 21 December, November 1675, he wrote a manuscript using this symbol, which now we notice for the first time. The same manuscript, product rule for differentiation is given. By August, uh, autumn 1674, Leibniz discovered the familiar uh, this differentiation of n power of x for both integral and fraction geometry. He invented calculus somewhere in the middle of the 1670s. He said that he thought of the ideas in about 1674 and then actually published the ideas in 1684, 10 years later, in Acta Iridium, same journals in 1694. His paper on calculus was called a new method of maxima minima as well tangents. It was six pages, it has six pages and was extremely obscure and were apparently too difficult to understand. So this is the title page uh, from his Acta in the Foundation of the Acta Iridium Journal of 1694. So this is the of the first article published in October 1964. The article Nova made just before Maxima is and yes, that is his first article. On this, on this page, for the 69, the page number is on the way. 
ಅನಿಸಿಕೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ಸೋ ಮಚ್ ಸರ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಸೋ ಮಚ್